Well, welcome to the third uh, Typo Cooper lecture in the Herb LeBallon lecture series here at Typo Cooper, the postgraduate certificate program in typeface design. Um, we have one more talk coming up in the summer. Uh, we have August uh, 3rd, Sumner Stone will be giving a lecture, so don't miss that. And you, uh, you can find out more information about that talk and the, uh, to sign up for that uh, is at uh, coopertype.org. Uh, I also want to thank Heffler & Co. for sponsoring the videotaping of all the lectures. Uh, this lecture, along with all the other lectures from this term, uh, is going to be available online. It's going to be on our website, and it's also going to be on our Vimeo channel. So uh, if you missed any talks, you can go back and look at them again. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Mark Jamra. Um, Mark is a typeface designer and an associate professor at Maine College of Art in, Maine, in Portland, Maine. He has designed and produced typefaces for over 30 years and is the founder of Type Culture, which is a type foundry and a wonderful online academic, uh, academic resource. It's a really great, great place. If you haven't seen uh, the articles that they've posted, uh, it's a really great resource for type. Uh, he has lectured, conducted workshops, and taught graphic design, type design, and history at colleges in US and Europe. Uh, his lettering and typefaces have been exhibited in numerous exhibitions and have received uh, awards from the Type Directors Club as well as the A Type I. And Mark is also a co founder of Jammer Patel uh, Studio for collaborative type studio practices. Please welcome Mark. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? I'm going to risk feedback here. There we go. Okay, well, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you, Kara, for the in invitation to uh, give this talk. And uh, so I'm going to tell you the story about, uh, there you go. I'm going to tell you the story about uh, uh, the typeface that was to become Forius Cherokee, which is out on the market right now. And uh, for the sake of context, I should probably begin by stating that I'm not Cherokee. Uh, I neither read, write, nor speak the Cherokee language. Um, I've designed type for many years, uh, but mostly in the Latin script. And uh, that would only partially prepare me for, for, uh, uh, for the tasks that I was, I was going to take on in, in designing the syllabary. Uh, just as often, I think it would trip me up uh, because it was such an entirely different thing. So the story I'm going to tell you has two beginnings. Uh, one beginning is in 1997, when I began the sketches for a few typefaces. Uh, one of them was a mono weight slab serif, and at the time, it really didn't take off for me. And so it disappeared into a drawer. And I'd only pull it out occasionally to develop it a little bit further when I had to take a break from other projects. And so this typeface stayed in a drawer, while other designs that succeeded it were developed and taken to market. It seemed like it was destined to be the perpetual bench warmer. You know, they let him sit on the bench, but you never really get to go out onto the field and play. The other beginning was in the summer of 2011 at TypeCon in New Orleans. Three guys from the Language Technology Office of the Cherokee Nation, and you see two of them here, Roy Boney and jo Joseph Erb, gave a presentation about their work with the Cherokee syllabary. They had developed a keyboard layout for it and successfully lobbied Apple to include a Cherokee font in all of their devices. And so it's there now. On iPhones, Macs, iPads. And this was a tremendous step towards their goal, which ultimately was the preservation of their language, which is in danger of eventually dying out. Having the syllabary on iPhones and iPads made the learning of it more appealing to Cherokee children. And younger generations learning the language is what they need to keep the language strong. Amazingly, though, there were only about two or three acceptable Cherokee fonts which they could actually use. And they ended their presentation with a dramatic plea to type designers to design Cherokee typefaces because they had so few. They said, you have tens of thousands of fonts, and they are a significant part of your visual culture. This is a part of our visual culture which we need to develop. Well, earlier in 2011, I had pulled the mono weight slab serif out of the drawer and had begun to develop it in, in earnest. It was time to make something of this thing. And after the presentation in that summer by Roy, Roy and Joseph, 
there were a couple of factors that caused me to take this on. One, I was just beginning a sabbatical year in which I could devote a good amount of time to a project of this sort. And two, my, my bench-warming mono-weight slab serif seemed particularly suitable to accommodating a Cherokee character set, since most of the historical images of manuscripts and handwritten documents, which I could find, were mono-weight as well, having been written with pencil, stylus dipped in ink, a spring pen, or a crow quill, without much variance in pressure. And so I contacted Joseph Erb, who immediately sent me some scans of handwritten documents. I also found a wonderful resource in the online manuscript archives of, this, of the Smithsonian Institution. But confronted with the actual syllabary itself in type, I had a thought that I suspect most type designers would think when faced with a syllabary. How the hell am I going to space this? Or this? Or this? A designer of the Latin alphabet knows it's absolutely critical to readability, to have spacing in a typeface that maintains an even rhythm of figure and ground, that this perfectly balanced yin and yang of black and white is essential to facilitating the reading process. How the hell am I going to deal with this? Or this? Also, I noticed something else about the syllabary, and that was that the range of form densities among the 85 glyphs was considerably greater than that of the Latin alphabet, whereas the proportions and densities of the Latin capital characters have been mitigated and evened out throughout the centuries, time being the great leveler. The Cherokee glyphs divided up space in a greater range of stroke densities, with varying densities in between. That made for a much more disruptive text image than I was used to dealing with. Of course, at this part of the process, I was asking all the wrong questions. But I would learn what the right questions are as I went along. Another problem was the lack of models. It's absolutely true. They didn't have much to work with. There are a few fonts out there that weren't Unicode compliant and are formally absolute train wrecks. This is one of them. You can download this. It's online. To me, Plantagenet was the best current example at that time of a, of a Cherokee typeface design with respects to visual quality, and there's a good reason for this. It was created by an actual type designer. So basically, I only had these, these two typefaces to look at for an idea of what was acceptable to the Cherokees. Plantagenet up at the top, which is on the Apple devices, and Digo Whaley, the official type of the Cherokee Nation, which is what they use on their official documents. And then down at the bottom, I had this one, which was created by Joseph Erb and which he called pretty crappy. But I thought, hey, it's a pretty sure thing that he got it right, so I'm going to keep an eye on that one as well. Because I was tense about getting it wrong, making mistakes, and creating glyphs that were unacceptable. And in the following months, I was going to learn a thing or two about those concerns as well. And so I started out creating the first drafts of glyphs based on the mono-weight slab serif, and doing the research along the way. I found the syllabary difficult to look at. It was so utterly different from what I was used to working with, or reading for that matter. And looking for inspiration in manuscripts was particularly challenging, because I, didn't often, I often didn't know what I was looking at. There were all these squiggles and odd shapes and things like that that I didn't even recognize in the handwriting at all, and I couldn't find any correlation to the typefaces. Along the way, I found a number of helpful articles online, especially Ellen Cushman's essay, The Cherokee Syllabary from Script to Print, in which she describes the process of how the first Cherokee types were created. This was when I learned that the type is actually a representation of a form of shorthand, adapted from an original longhand script. In the bibliography of the essay, I noticed that Cushman had, had authored an entire book called The Ch Ch Cherokee Syllabary, Writing the People's Perseverance, and that it was due to be published on December 10th, 2011. And I stumbled across this little item on approximately December 10th, 2011. 
I'm not joking. I was on it, like a pack of wild dogs. I ordered from Amazon that day. I was probably her first sale. I got it at the beginning of January, and the essay I had read earlier was chapter four. Around the middle of January, I was still reading Cushman's book, but the first draft of the 85 glyphs in the lightweight was done, and so I sent a specimen to Joseph for his first impressions. His response was, we went over the font. It looks really great. I know you are adjusting some of the spacing still, but as for the glyphs, they are easily read. You have done a really good job making a new Cherokee font. And my internal reaction to that was twofold. Half of me thought, wow, that's great. And the other half thought, but is it any good? And I realized here what I should have realized from the very beginning. I mean, what was I expecting? The guys in the language technology office are not type designers, so they couldn't very well act as art directors. To be honest, I didn't know yet how to ask questions to the members of a language community when working on a non-Latin non script. This is something that has learned with experience. And I, haven't, I didn't have it at that time. So this is going to be an interesting challenge. And to me, it made it all the more important that I learn as much as, as possible about the, about the function and historical aspect of the syllabary in order to have a mental framework for designing it. Fortunately, reading Cushman's book while continuing development of my design was creating a kind of watershed moment for me. And I want to mention here, these, these, the markings on these proofs here, those are all from me to myself. Uh, I'll normally uh, hang proofs up on the wall and uh, look at them for anywhere from 24 hours to I don't know, 24 weeks, depending on what else is going on. And, uh, and then uh, uh, as I go by, I'll take a look at it, and as I find things, I'll, I'll make a note. But this watershed moment was happening. The historical context, the descriptions of how the syllabary functions, and also the political context in which it was created, was making it more familiar to me and began to open up the field of possibilities that was available to me in designing it. I was beginning to sense that I actually had more leeway in design than I had previously suspected. The fear of making mistakes was beginning to slip away. Now, don't get me wrong, Cushman didn't give me a blow-by-blow -blow instruction manual on how to design Cherokee glyphs. She's a professor of writing, rhetoric, and American cultures at Michigan State University and a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. And she approaches the topic from that perspective. But what she did tell me was what actually makes the Cherokee syllable what, syllabary what it is, historically and functionally. And that gave me a context in which I could begin to place its visual aspects. Above all, she stresses that the Cherokee syllabary, if it is to be understood, may not be viewed through the alphabetic lens. Slowly but surely, my question of how am I going to space these things evolved into how is Cherokee read? This was the more pertinent question because the glyph forms are connected to their function and meanings and the spacing is connected to the reading process as it is with the Latin alphabet. But my question about space of the glyphs had always been asked through the alphabetic lens. The history of the syllabary is that it was invented by a single person, a Cherokee named Sequoia. And this could be called the officially accepted story. I've found dissenting opinions, of course, online. Some people think it didn't go like this at all. But this is what recent researchers, Cushman, the anthropologist Margaret Bender, and the librarian Joseph Thomas, as well as the Cherokee Nation itself, considered to be the, sto considered to be the story of this particular writing system. There are no photos of Sequoia, only idealized representations in various forms. His status in Cherokee history is almost mythical by now, definitely larger than life. By the early 1800s, the power by which the white men could talk on paper, transporting their spoken words through time and space, had been noticed and wondered at by many Cherokees. They marveled at it. I mean, you have to imagine this. This is not illiteracy, knowing about literacy and just not being able to read. This is never having seen it before. So a guy over here says something, makes some marks on a piece of paper. That piece of paper is taken down the road out of earshot, it's handed to someone else, he looks at the paper, and he says exactly the same thing as the first guy. It's magic. And at first they despaired, 
because they thought that this was a form of magic that only the white people could have. And at that time, they were struggling to maintain their identity and culture amongst the ever-increasing incursion of white settlers on their territories, and also their self-esteem and in being perceived as a, cult, as a civilized people by the whites. Many Cherokees thought that the written speech of the white man was one of the mysterious gifts of the great spirit, and it wasn't intended for them. But Sequoia didn't really think so. He thought it was just a mere ingenious invention that the Cherokees could master, if only they would try. He was a metalsmith and a draftsman, and he also had a thorough knowledge of the Cherokee language. It is speculated that he also knew some English, but chose never to speak it. In fact, he eschewed English and felt that the Latin script was insufficient for accommodating the Cherokee language. And from what I read of Cushman's explanation of it, that is entirely possible. Linguists identify five levels of meaning in a language, and according to Cushman, the Cherokee writing system can actually represent four of them. To quote Cushman, each Cherokee glyph potentially communicates sound as well as semantic, morphological, and syntactic meaning. This depth of linguistic information is unusual." End quote. Cherokee is what linguists call a polysynthetic language, in which words can consist of a high number of morphemes. Morphemes are the smallest meaningful unit of a language. Therefore, one word in Cherokee can be an entire sentence in which each syllable uttered can have meaning. Sequoia thought a different system was needed and is reported to have spent 10 years working on it. Finally, setting on a system of 85 glyphs that covered every spoken syllable in the Cherokee language, he developed a longhand cursive that had no resemblance to the Latin alphabet. The first person to read and write with the new invention was his daughter, Ayoka. However, his work on this innovation over the years generated a considerable amount of suspicion within his community people didn't understand it. Although the system was foolproof and easy to learn, Sequoia and his daughter were charged with witchcraft and were brought before George Lowry, their town chief, for a trial. Due to a Cher Cherokee law enacted in 1811, it was mandated to have a civil trial before an execution was allowed to take place. Lowry brought in a group of warriors to judge what was termed a sorcery trial. For evidence of the literacy claims, the warriors separated Sequoia and his daughter to have them send messages between each other until they were finally convinced that the symbols on paper really represented talking. And at the end of the trial, the warriors asked Sequoia to teach them this new skill. Within a week, all were able to read and write their own language because part of Sequoia's strategy was to create a system that had a design which facilitated the learning of it. The warriors are known historically as a fierce group of Cherokees, and with their protection, protection and patronage, literacy spread quickly throughout the Cherokee nation, up to 95%. It's interesting to look back on this and realize that a unique writing system is not common amongst Native American tribes. I live in Portland, Maine, and the four tribes in Maine, the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, the Mi'kmaq, and the Maliseet, chose to use the writing system brought by the white settlers and, as far as I can tell, simply do alliteration of their spoken language. Although the syllable behavior of Passamaquoddy reminds me of Cherokee at first glance, for as little as I understand of it. Sequoia's efforts were also political acts in which he and the Cherokees created a clear demarcation between the Cherokee and the Eurocentric <coughs> cultures. The creation of the syllabary, viewed from a historical distance, seems to me to be part of a continuum of tactics, a, consistency, a consistent strategy of putting cultural stakes in the sand and saying, this is our culture. This is what belongs to us. This is what defines us. And of course, language is a huge component of culture. Margaret Bender, in her book, Signs of Cherokee Culture from 2003, sensed that this is the greater value of the syllabary. She emphasizes that its most important role is in possessing an iconicity that manifests the Cherokee cultural identity. This, by the way, is reputed to be, this is in the Gilcrease Museum in, uh, I think, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, this was reputed to have been created by uh, Sequoia for a man named John Howard Payne, showing both the longhand and the shorthand of the syllabary. This fine fellow here is Samuel Worcester. He was a white missionary who worked tirelessly with the Cherokees and is responsible for facilitating the casting of a lead font. 
so that the Cherokee language could be printed and disseminated in larger circles. But the longhand didn't lend itself very well to a conversion to type. So Sequoia developed a kind of shorthand to be used for printing. Two written accounts state that Sequoia was looking for ideas for the shorthand when he saw the shape of the letters in an English language Bible. And he modeled some of the glyphs for print by picking out capitals and lowercase letters and italics and figures, placing them right side up and upside down without any idea of their sound or significance as used in English, finally saying that the new glyphs would do for print and the old ones would do for writing. But it really didn't work out that way. It's interesting to note that the shorthand, once it was developed, was used in handwriting as well, even before a lead font could be made. The syllabary provided by Chief Charles Hicks in 1825 to the Bureau of India, Indian Affairs, as what you see here, suggests this, as do manuscripts at that time. The longhand fell quickly out of use. Cushman provides an explanation of why Sequoia suddenly opted for forms that he had, pre he had previously avoided. At the time when Sequoia was designing the shorthand, he was under some political pressure to provide a type for the syllabary because the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missionaries, the ABCFM, were trying to put through an alphabetic representation of Cherokee that Sequoia and tribal elders resisted. Once the shorthand was devised, the Cherokees prevailed and Worcester commissioned the first font of the shorthand from the Boston foundry of Baker and Greel and also worked with the ABCFM to have a printing press brought to the capital of the Cherokee Nation in New Echota, Georgia. And you have to remember, this was before the removal to Indian Territory, which is now Oklahoma, the so-called Trail of Tears. And the, the Cherokee's original territory covered broad expanses of South Carolina, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia. This part of the story happened in a relatively short period of time. The syllabary had been adopted by the Tribal Council in 1821, and issue number one of the first Cherokee language newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix, was published in 1828. Here you see it was bilingual. Uh, it was in English and Cherokee, which you can't read from this slide. I can't even read it on the computer here. It's, it's too small, but you can see actually which columns contain Cherokee. Uh, this is the first issue. And it, uh, they published on the first page the beginning of the uh, constitution of the Cherokee Nation. The first two columns, going from left to right, the first two columns are uh, in English. And then in the middle, you have a Cherokee translation of the second column, and then another, another column of English. And then on the right, you have a, uh, a column of Cherokee. You can tell it's Cherokee because, remember, we're talking about a syllabary where every glyph represents a syllable. So it gets the job done faster. You just end up with a lot of white space. Coming to know all this information began to break down walls for me. And I began to realize that I had a lot more room to move in than I previously suspected in designing Cherokee glyphs. Tell them we're busy. I had also spent enough time with them so that, so that, I, sorry, that, I, so that I was becoming a little more com comfortable with them. The, the development of a bold weight brought some challenges with it mostly because the Latin bold had already been developed and the more dense glyphs in the syllabary made the accommodation of all that planar mass really difficult. But that's when my experience kicked in and uh, I managed well enough. But the question occurred to me, why had no one designed a multi-weight type family for the Cherokee? There are a couple of bold Cherokee fonts out there, but they are horrendous. This is another one. You can download this, it's online. And anyone who has used font development software knows how this is done. Select all, make bold, 50 units, click OK. Remove overlap, click OK. <laughs> done. Amongst the types that the language technology office guys said that they could actually use, they all had only one weight. In general, I was amazed at how few, Cher few typefaces the Cherokees had until I read up more on the, their history and realized that the speaking of their language and the writing of it using their syllabary had been systematically and with official authority suppressed as late as the 1960s. During the forced infusion of English into the Cherokee culture, the syllabary may have lost some of its clout as a writing system, having been replaced by a, often by a transliteration of Cherokee using the Latin alphabet after all. But it maintained its role as an icon of Cherokee culture, as Bender suggests. 
it's only recent that they've been able to, to build the resources again in this regard. And it occurred to me that the plea during the conference for new typefaces was not only a logical move to address a perceived deficiency, but also part of a strategy to reinstall it as a robust writing system in order to strengthen their language and their cultural identity. So why not a multi-weight family? And so I went ahead and began to make one. Also at about this time, I asked Joseph what he thought of my creating an italic, not an oblique of upright glyphs, but a real cursive italic, one that showed more the influence of handwriting. Basically, typographically, there has never been a Cherokee italic. And his response was interesting. He thought I should give it a try and said that Cherokee speakers liked the variations in handwriting, but that their fonts never showed that variety. And with his response, he sent me a PDF. And this is when something significant happened. He had sent me a scan of a letter handwritten in Cherokee, and it included an English translation. But what was really important was that he had also typed out the text of the letter in Plantagenet. I have no idea why he did this. But finally, I was able to equate some of the squiggles and odd shapes I had been seeing in Cherokee manuscripts and the glyphs of the syllabary. This was my Rosetta Stone. Suddenly, I could identify the inexplicable forms I had been seeing in the scans that Joseph had sent me previously, as well as the manuscripts at the Smithsonian. Using the letter and the key, I could see how many of the shorthand glyphs changed when they were written by hand, and some of them changed significantly. It became clear to me that I wasn't going to be creating an italic that just had an angle and some handwriting nuances in the off strokes. It was going to have some glyphs that were handwriting specific, just like an italic in the Latin script. Once I was able to decipher the glyphs in the manuscripts, I was able to accumulate a number of different variations for each glyph and decide which would be the most suitable basis for its counterpart in the italic. It was encouraging to see that when upright glyphs changed in handwriting, these transformations had become a kind of standard in and of themselves. So I wouldn't be channeling an odd one-off quirk of an individual writer in 1853 or whenever, but rather be creating glyphs that would be recognizable to anyone who can read Cherokee handwriting. Still, each glyph that changed could have a considerable num number of variations to choose from. It was also interesting to note that some glyphs didn't change at all when written by hand, and I have no idea why. By the latter half of April of 2012, I had a first draft of a Cherokee cursive italic, which I sent in a proof to Joseph. I said, this took a lot of work. And I looked at a lot of documents, the ones you had sent me, the ones I found at the Smithsonian, I looked at a lot to familiarize myself with various handwritten styles in Cherokee. Although this first draft is based more or less on forms which were found in Cherokee manuscripts, I may be overstepping the boundaries of what is acceptable to Cherokee readers. I need you to look at this and tell me what works and what doesn't work, and even if it makes sense to continue in this direction at all. And I sent the proof off, and then I didn't hear anything. Not for a week. I was used to getting a response in a couple of days. And a week became two weeks, and then three weeks. And after three weeks, I received this response. The font looks great, and a true start from italic scratch font, start from scratch italic font. Several people really like it, and some think that some of the glyphs look strange. Many have not seen a version of handwriting in a font this way, and some of the old handwriting is strange for younger people to read. But overall, I think it is really great. He said he thought acceptance of the italic would come with use. He was also unsure of some of the glyphs, but didn't want to start messing with it, and assured me that it does follow existing handwriting. He said, it is hard to get 100% approval on anything. Cherokee people have independent minds. We are getting used to, different, to seeing different fonts and seeing Cherokee in different ways. Imagine you see one main font for generation after generation. After that long, new fonts are a shock to the system, and in this case, I think it is a good shock. This is something new. Well, needless to say, I was rather excited by this response, 
and no, well, that's actually an understatement. I whooped and punched the air for about 15 minutes. And uh, because you know, what had I done? And and so highly motivated, I set to developing the italic further. The bold italic brought some of the same challenges of the bold, but fortunately, some of the italic forms are more open than their upright counterparts. I continued to make changes to the proportions of the glyphs and as I became more comfortable with them. Here you see three generations of a single glyph. In the first, on the left, you can see that I'm anxious about spacing it, and then I'm keeping the element on the right as small as possible, so that it would be as little of a spacing problem as, as possible. As time went on, and the question turned from an issue of spacing to an understanding of the glyph, the right element grew in size until I saw that it is not an appendage st stuck onto a Roman letter, but rather in an important element of the total glyph that has to have a real presence in the glyph. I continued to make changes to the proportions of all the glyphs as I became more comfortable with them. Then there was the issue of the overall spacing. Since I can't read the syllabary, I wasn't sure what the best spacing should be. The lead type in historical examples, like the Cherokee Phoenix, is spaced out really wide while digital fonts like Plantagenet and Diggle Whaley are spaced close together, in the, uh, like the Latin alphabet. My research brought me to the conclusion that the Cherokee glyphs should be spaced wider than alphabetic letters, like the optimal spacing for, for caps, perhaps even wider. Considering that many of the characters, or that many of the character groups in written Cherokee can equal entire sentences in English, the word space is also not unimportant. And when the syllabary is offered in a font with a Latin character set, as it usually is, the word space is usually set for optimal use amongst the Latin lower case. But when the Cherokee glyphs have the vertical and horizontal proportions of the upper case, that calls for wider glyph spacing, and that calls for a wider word space as well. I had to consider my strategy for the design's priorities, and that it should be a Cherokee typeface with an accompanying Latin complement and not the other way around. So the default word space is set for the Cherokee glyphs, and for the first version of Cher Fourier's Cherokee, kerning values are, are used to adjust the Latin glyphs into it. Finally, I designed a set of small cap versions of the syllabary so that bilingual texts set in Cherokee and the Latin script would acquire approximately the same color when set at the same size. Which brings me, finally, to Fourier's Cher Cherokee 2.0 which is underway right now. In the past couple of years, the Cherokees have been working on developing a lower case for their syllabary. And this is nothing short of historic. I mean, th th making additions to a writing system for the first time in almost 200 years after its invention. And although the, the, ins the inspiration for these has come from how Cherokee was often said in the past, Unicode points were applied for and ultimately approved. And with the release of the Unicode Standard 8.0 last month, the new Cherokee lowercase can now be included and used in digital fonts. So now I'm working on that, making some adjustments in form and proportion on all the glyphs along the way. And in conclusion, it seems to me that with the different levels of meaning inherent to each syllable in the Cherokee language and the iconic status of the syllabary, the visual voice of the glyphs may have taken a lower priority to, in the Cherokee's relationship to their writing, writing system. But people like Joseph and Roy, who have been instrumental in coordinating digital communication in the Cherokee Nation, have recognized that the syllabary needs to make up ground in this area of voice and style and personality. As they said in their presentation in 2011, variety in typefaces is an important part of visual culture and more Cherokee typeface designs will be essential to their efforts in building the strength of their written language. The aggressive and coordinated effort the Cherokees have brought to preserve their language and culture is just plain impressive. I just can't stop from being impressed by what they're doing. In the years since 2011, they've developed a lowercase for their writing system. They've worked with Microsoft to develop a Windows interface in Cherokee and with Google to develop Google Search and Gmail interfaces, inventing thousands of Cherokee terms for computer technology in the process. Just this month, July, they've announced that Cherokee is now available on Android phones. 
I was amazed, and I remain amazed, at the opportunities that the particular history of this writing system affords type designers at this time. There's a lot to be learned and a lot to be done, and every bit of it is meaningful. Wat Do, thank you. It's one of two Cherokee words that I know. <laughs> so is there a Q&A at the, at the end of this? Sumner, we need, a, we need a mic down to, do we have a microphone? He's loud, okay. Bellow. Um, I'm very interested in what, what a lower case if you have, and, and, and the whole question of what the grouping together of characters into quotes and words are if a word actually contains multiple words. Right. Um, I asked I ask myself that, that same question when, when I started developing the small caps. At first I thought, I'm not going to use small caps. I mean, they're not letters. They're there's syllables there, so it doesn't make any sense if the if the, the first syllable is large and the, the rest. But then it made uh, sense to to develop something that they could use when used in bilingual text to, to achieve the same color as say English with the upper and lower case. When it actually comes to their lower case, I'm not entirely sure how that functions. I can't really tell you that. Um, uh, I think the Is the lowercase different than the small Not much. No. No, it's not. It's not. And I had to find that out. Because in the, you know, those Unicode charts that you get, you can download for that, for that section, for the new lowercase, they have examples, they have letters there that show some A senders and D senders. And uh, they were, uh, done by a linguist who, who had assisted the Cherokee in obtaining those Unicode code points. And, uh, uh, but in my conversations, in my correspondence with Roy Boney in the Language Technology Office, uh, he has made it clear that the Cherokee prefer more tra a more traditional approach. And that means something that they're used to seeing. And that's why I showed you that manuscript, because that's what they're used to seeing, is basically just a small version of the, of the, the large versions. My job right now, as far as I can see, is battling that density uh, in those small sizes, that stroke density. And so, uh, you know, together with him and a couple of the other, hopefully a couple of the other people in, in, the, in the Cherokee Nation there in Tahlequah, uh, I'll be able to uh, devise some forms that do not go too far from the traditional form, but open up the counters as much as possible. Because it does get something like the dla, which is basically three rings like that. It was on one of the slides as the densest symbol that I could find in there. That shuts down in small sizes. It gets very dark. And that will slow down reading. And so uh, uh, that's, that's my key job right now, is to, is to find opportunities to open up the counters of those letters uh, by abbreviating, abbreviating this stroke and here and that stroke there, or you know, maybe disconnecting something or the other. Uh, I can do subtle little changes, and the more daring changes, I'm definitely going to run by them and say, is this OK? Uh, but how it actually functions. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how that works with a syllabary. Other, other than, uh, excuse me, other than just say, having a having a large form there at the beginning of a sentence or a proper name to start the sentence, pretty much as we do, you know, in English. So if, if the words can be a sentence, then does the word space function? Not that I'm aware of, because they do have periods as well in commas. So what, Phrases that separate it out 
Yeah, yeah, as far as I know. That would be my understanding of it. Mm -hmm. Was that any help to you at all? None at all. Not at all. I told you, we've been, we're working on the Vi syllabary, which is a West African script right now. And that's also completely different. It's like, it's like, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to be, it's, it's like trail signs almost. It's just, it's, you know, it's, it's just a completely different thing. But all basically, and there are, the Cherokee has 85 syllables apparently. Vi has something like 212 to cover it's all the, like the sounds. Yes, and what they can cover in it. I mean, it's just, uh, there's, a, there's a new book out. It's a reference book uh, called uh, Cherokee Reference Grammar. It just came out. And it has some information in there. Uh, you try to get into it, and it's kind of dense. But, uh, and I, I just sort of skimmed it a little bit and found some information about how, about how it works. It's just amazing. You can have, first of all, you can have a future that, that stays put or a future that's coming towards you. Uh, you can have, there's, there's a kind of animal declination as well, so that depending on which syllable you use, uh, humans are sort of the higher order, then there's animals under that and insects and birds under that. And depending on which uh, animal is being referred to and the, the, and, the, and, the, and the syllable that you're using, you can determine through that context what the subject of the sentence is and what the, the object is, whether it's human or an animal. So there could be a difference. You, they would say something different uh, for, what was the example that they had? Uh, uh, the, the woman is kicking the horses uh, as opposed to the horses are kicking the woman, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's an un it's an unbelievable language, it seems to me. I wish I understood more of it. Is, is there any more information about Sequoia and how, you know, his background and how he might have, is it all mythological? It's almost myth, I mean, yeah, they have their official story and, and uh, it's interesting because from the time that I started the project to the time that I ended at least with version one, the, the story on their website had changed a little bit as, as new information came in. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, uh, he also, uh, contributing to the whole mythology, of course, it was uh, he, they don't know where he's buried. In fact, they don't really know where he died. Uh, he went on a trip with two other guys off, I think, towards Texas or something, and just never came back, and somebody reported that he was dead, that kind of thing. It was, it's a very, it's, it's perfect for creating a myth, you know? You can't find a grave site to put your finger on or something like that. Is, is the term a common thing for churches? Yes, they, uh, they emphasize, you know, if, if you're, in some tourist location or something like that, and they say, "I'm a Cherokee," and you know, and it's uh, and he's wearing a, a war bonnet or something. Plains Indians, they they never wore, you know, war bonnets or, or anything like that. But uh, 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 that yeah, the, the 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 that was typical. They also didn't live in teepees or you know anything like that. Is you know, sort of normal houses and and uh, there are three bands of Cherokee by the way, officially recognized bands of Cherokee. Uh, the Cherokee Nation is only one of them. Uh, and they're in, they're, their base is in Tulloch, Oklahoma. Uh, with them in Tulloch are the United Kituwa tribe. Uh, and they, I was telling you earlier, right, they're sometimes like this because they're in the same place and they're, they argue over each other's legitimacy as being the true Cherokee tribe. And then there's the Eastern Band and they're in North Carolina. In fact, in the very western tip of North Carolina, there's Cherokee, North Carolina. And uh, they are actually the descendants of the people who escaped the soldiers and hid out in the hills, in those hills back there where if you didn't want to be found, no one was going to find you. And uh, 
so they hid from the, the soldiers and those are the descendants. And they, they are referred to as the old folks. And there's a different way that they speak. I think Cushman, between Oklahoma and, and, and the Eastern Band, Cushman related it to kind of like the difference between American and British English. So they have uh, a different way of, of speaking that was carried on down through the years. Did the other two bands use the references? Yes. Yes. Any, there's a question right there. Um, Sequoia developed a system of numbers, written a written system of numbers, which were never used. They uh, they just opted for the Indo-Arabic numbers that we we used. And uh, but just recently, I think it was a couple years ago, one of the uh, elders responsible for the uh, for language uh, sort of set to reviving them again, and. Uh, I asked about them. I said, "Are we are we going to be looking at numbers pretty soon?" And uh, and they said, "Probably not for a while. You know, it's uh, they haven't applied for Unicode points code points for it yet or anything like that." But he did uh, have he did sort of revive it, figure out what it meant, and it was sort of a unique system which he claimed was uh, very Cherokee, whatever that means. And uh, and I think he had to invent a billion. I think it went up to a million, and, and then a billion just wasn't a concept back in the day. So what, is it like a number system that has a particular base, or is it like a regular system? Program? No, it's a, it, has a, it has a base. That's, it, it seems to me like it's a base that sort of multiplies upwards, kind of like powers of 10 kind of thing. Yeah, like that. I'd have to look into it more. I sort of glanced at it, asked about it, and when it wasn't relevant, I, I had enough to do, so I didn't really. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure. I can't really speak authoritatively to that. I do know that in Cherokee language courses, they use both. They find that uh, a transliteration using the Latin alphabet is often easier uh, for people to learn the words, and uh, and and then the syllabary is used to it comes after. Uh, they've also uh, Margaret Bender pointed out that some of the forms in the syllabary that are very reminiscent of of Latin forms they can trip people up. Actually, Sequoia had the right idea with the longhand because they didn't have anything to, you know, it's, it's easier. When, when people are learning to, to read something like this, I mean, this is wa, do. So, uh, uh, and, and I think if, I think I showed the syllabary enough starting with D, R, T. Remember that? Okay, those are vowels. So, you know, they, they have, and so that trips people up a lot. And, uh, uh, they have a couple of uh, immersion schools, one in the east and one in the west, to start children at a very young age, where they just go in and it's, only Cherokee is spoken there. They're they're struggling, uh, but uh, they're doing they're doing so many things. To I'm I'm really impressed with what with what they're doing because there are so many other tribes out there. Their language is just sort of going away, and they're just not making this two-fisted effort. To, to maintain it and keep it alive. And these guys are just going for it. It's unbelievable. They told this great story at, at TypeCon when, that uh, when, they, when they told the, uh, the elders that, that Apple had agreed to, to put this, the syllabary on, on its devices, then they said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's, let's look at this font. And, uh, and so, the guys who designed Plantagenet, they, they literally had to run it by the, the tribal elders, and they had to make some changes for it. But then when, it, when, when it, it was actually installed, 
they said the reaction that they got was just amazing. They'd go into the community centers and the, the old people would be there who still speak the, still talk the talk. And they'd show them, they say, look. And they'd see the syllabary on the, on the phone and, they'd, and they, they, they said the reaction would be almost exactly the same, it would be, oh. it's like, we're part of it now. We're part of this whole stream of things going on right now. It's like, now we belong in, in sort of the flow of things. And they were just amazed by it. And they said at that time, it was also starting to work. It was starting to bring the kids into the community centers to talk to the old folks and to, and to try speaking Cherokee with them. And, uh, and that was their strategy with Apple right from the very beginning was uh, you know, how do we get kids interested in this? What are all kids interested in? Cool stuff, you know? And so let's put it on an iPhone. And, and uh, so uh, it's smart, you know? <laughs> yes? Oh, shaded, you mean as in shadowed or? Yeah. Higher contrast. Higher contrast. Um, oh. oh. I think they would be perfectly, I mean, Plantagenet uh, is, is kind of close in its, in its uh, contrast and its stress to Baskerville. Um, there's another one out there, uh, Digo Whaley is, is was done by a linguist, and, and he seems to use times as his basis for everything. And uh, uh, there's also one out there that has very high stroke contrast, which is akin to Bodoni, something like that. I think they're fine with that because uh, really the first type was very similar to that. And, and they're very sort of traditionally minded. They, they, they're, they're most comfortable with things that have been there for a long time. And so things like the italic, that I created, and even something like this, a typeface that's mono-weight, even though all the handwriting and all those manuscripts were mono-weight, a typeface that's mono-weight is something that, they're, they're, that they have to get used to. And, uh, and it's, a, it's sort of a slow process to, to introduce these things. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, was trying to develop some display fonts uh, in the syllabary and, and wasn't getting satisfactory responses from them at all. I think you know, that's sort of too far down the line right now. They need a, you know, a lot of text faces and, uh, and it's really, it's, I think it's a matter of getting more out there, more variation, and then you can start getting a little more fanciful in where you take it once, once they start seeing more variation in, in the type that they're using. So it, it's, uh, since the first type face had all those properties of a traditional Latin, say, Baskerville or something like that, they're perfectly okay with that. It, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be too much of a problem. Uh, a colleague of mine has, has created a multi-weight sans serif for them and, uh, and obliques instead of cursive italics. Uh, and they're okay with that. Joseph Erb did, I mean, he's crazy. He did, he did, uh, he did a, a black letter Cherokee font, which is hysterical. He actually got it to, to work. It's no small feat, you know. But I think for most of them, that would be a little too much right now. Yes? I, I do know that they have uh, uh, they do have a, a syllabic system that is almost Canada wide. A lot of the First Nations avail themselves of it. Uh, I don't know that much more about it or about what they're they're uh, doing, but it's uh, I imagine I, I thoroughly if you if you were to tell me that I would 
totally believe it. Uh, I know in Maine, it's, it's been a very, just recently, it's been in the news where uh, the government of Maine has uh, agreed to pay reparations for, well, one of the ways that they, I, I mentioned the suppressing of, of the Cherokee language up until rather re recently, one of the ways they did that was to take their children away and put them in uh, boarding schools. And, uh, and their hair was cut and they were forced to wear white people's clothing. And if they were caught speaking their language or writing in their language, they were punished. And, and, uh, and you know, you could bet that most of those places were pretty horrible. And uh, just recently, I think it was this year, they, they mentioned that the, the government in Maine uh, is making reparations to that happening right in Maine, in further up east, down east. Uh, and uh, you can tell I'm not from Maine. I, I slipped on that. Uh, so uh, uh, that's still a very sort of current thing. But uh, it's not it's not stupid. You want to you want to eradicate a culture? You go for the language. You know, language. It's big stuff. Any others? Yes. Well, in the beginning, the first thing I did was uh, uh, f look for all the uh, characters that were most like the Latin, like that eye, the, the eye with the appendage on it. You know, I just put that out there and stick this thing onto it. You know, that'll work, right? And uh, uh, and also, it was, uh, you know, like I said, I was very, I was very nervous. I didn't want them coming back and saying this is unusable. You know, this is an affront. We hate you. You know, we we you know, I don't want, I didn't want that. I didn't want that happening, and so I was very, I was overly cautious at first, and and really tried to stay within the lines of what I saw in those in those typefaces that I had in front of me there, and it was really it was a slow process at first. Uh, you know, I couldn't even really look at them properly, and then I had to spend some months with them and just working on them, and 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 looking at proofs and molding and forming them and redrawing them and that kind of thing. And after a while, it just sort of, and doing the research, gaining all that knowledge, which by the way is half the fun, it's really great. Uh, but just gaining all that knowledge and slowly but surely, you can't really say, oh, that piece of knowledge, that sentence in that book right there just lit up the world for me and suddenly I understood. You can't, it, it just all sort of came slowly together. And then uh, even now, when I go back to, and I'm, I'm working on version 2.0, I said I'm, I'm revisiting some of the letters or some of the glyphs that were already there, it's simply because I've become even more comfortable with it. And I, and I, and I realize, oh yeah, I didn't have to sort of stay in a corner here and, on that one. I could actually do this with it, and it would still be okay. But you have to find that line. You cross over that line, and uh, like the, 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 co the colleague who, who designed the, the sans serif, he took something off on a couple of glyphs that he felt were serifs. Uh-uh. No, they came back and it's like, don't do that. Put that back, you know. It was, it was not a serif, you know. So you got to know where, you know, where, the, where the threshold is. And, and, and that just takes looking at all the manuscripts and looking at the, the typefaces, even, even the lousy ones, uh, uh, to, to sort of familiarize yourself with it as much as possible. And slowly but surely, and communicating with them as well. That's important communicating with them and and getting a sense of what they're comfortable with and also uh, and asking the right questions which is uh, with, which I'm learning um, you can't ask like what do you think of this serif it's like no you know okay great thanks a lot